Hey guys, so I just made my way down to the Woodlands, Texas. I'll be here for a couple days for work. The company that I work for is based out of the Woodlands. So I'm kind of getting my stuff together here to go out and hit a park. The forecast said it was going to be a little rainy, but right now it's, it's uh, well, it's humid, but it's not raining. And actually the sun is out. I'm tired. I've been working a couple days on just getting this bad boy together. You know, when it the first time I put a, a type of build together, you know, I, I'm taking my time, I mean my sweet ass time, and really trying to figure out how I want to put everything together and keeping it fairly neat and keeping other things in mind like maintenance and uh, replacement parts and whatnot, so. It's just the way I roll. But you know, sometimes finding that balance between work and family and and hobby is a little tough, and that's what I've been struggling with lately. Um, I got all the important stuff in there, so work and family are fine, but hobby is leaving a little bit to be desired. Between the stuff going on with work and family, it's not leaving a whole lot of time. Ugh. Leaving a whole lot of time for hobby, so is what it is but I get a hankering you know so this here is my platform uh, this is what I have settled on it is gonna be my hardware unless I can find some really really good reason for it not to be and I just want to take you guys through what I'm running here and why so let's start with the frame since it's the base and the foundation for everything now Frames, I'm one of those people I refuse, I just refuse to go out and buy a $100 frame. Not because I'm not saying they're not worth it, but to me they're not. Because I know what it costs to buy the carbon, even have it manufactured to your own specs, to have it cut, blah blah blah. And if you are a legitimate manufacturer and you have the equipment already, which is how you do this, you don't try to throw a hundred percent of your product cost onto the first job and then think you're going to maintain it and have just outrageous margins throughout. It's just not how it works. So anyway, all of us know Bob Ruge. All of us know that Kebab is big when it comes to frame design and you know for him too it's not just it's not just him sitting in a CAD program and kind of dreaming up some shapes. This guy flies his stuff. There are guys out there designing frames that don't even fly their own frames. I mean, that says something. Bob flies his frames. He designs his frame for himself and then has the courtesy to share them with the rest of us. And he does so at a price point that's very competitive. I mean, him and Serge have the finances figured out to get the order quantities in there to hit the prices they want. Bob's getting what he wants out of it. Serge is getting something out of it. Everybody's getting something out of it, which is how this is supposed to work, including the consumer, without getting shafted on price. So what I'm running here is the floss style frame. And that is because it gives just enough room for all the stuff that I want in there without having an abundance of room, which don't get me wrong, I don't complain about having too much room. I don't think I've ever complained about having too much room. But it's got enough room for everything to comfortably fit in here with a little bit of planning. And I like this because right before he released this, I thought, you know, I was looking for a frame, something I can settle on, and I've just been watching him. And when he released the flow ride frame, I bought two of those. I totally get what he's doing because I've experienced it now myself with, you know, managing this airspace between the front and rear props. He gives plenty of room for battery, plenty of room for GoPro. GoPro's not an afterthought. I mean, he has holes and things engineered in that top plate just for GoPro. The fact that he's got four columns of standoffs, two millimeter top and bottom plates, 
five millimeter arms, and you know the arms are that new boom, well I say new, his newest, boomerang style where they are connected in the middle. And with this plate put here for some tension and compression just to play on everything, the thick plates and then the arms on top of it, this thing is a beast. I haven't even flown it yet and I just know it's a beast. It's a beast based on what he did with his flow ride frame. So next, moving on up, I have nothing against BL Heli S ESCs. I think they fly great. D-Shot 600 is more than sufficient, and if you want to run multi-shot, you know, then you're going to get more resolution in things and, and get more, more out of your ESCs by just having to do a calibration once in a while. It's not that big a deal, right? But I've also flown BL Heli 32 ESCs and I like a couple, I like a little bit of what they do better. And, and what I'm splitting here, I mean, I'm really splitting hairs because the difference in resolution, yeah, you can hear it, you can feel it somewhat, but it's not something that, you know, that everybody's going to be able to pick up on. I will happily fly BL Heli S and D Shot 600 and never complain. But I figure, you know what? We have a really good 4 in 1 ESC here, uh, and that's the AK 32. It's an Acon. BL Heli 32 running D Shot 1200. Um, I settled on 4 in 1 ESCs months ago. They're just a lot easier to maintain, they're a lot cleaner. I just don't think. I've never had one just fully out and fry on me. Um, as a racer, you may have some of that as you're pushing stuff to the brink. It's not something I've had a problem with. And then I took a, a note from Kebab and I went with that Heli Nation Talon F4. Uh, it's a 20 by 20, really small. It's very, very similar to the Hyperlite Pyroflip F4 OSD. It's just in a smaller package. It, uh, it's very clean, very simple. The pads are very well organized, has all the trademarks of a, a quality board. So I feel pretty comfortable that, that I'm going to be able to settle on that. And if for some reason I don't want this 20 by 20, I will still be using the Pyro Flip F4, or the Hyperlite F4 OSD, because it is a marvelous board. It is nothing but engineered quality through and through. So. I don't need any of that hype train $50, $60 flight controller stuff. It's just not worth it. I don't care what you say, you will never sell me that it's worth it. The last item in the powertrain are these Sumax Innovations. Now, again, just a bout of luck. I found out as I bought my first set of these, put them on a quad and completely fell in love with them, that Sumax quit making motors for quadcopters. They have now moved into the aquatics market. They are making, essentially for RC boats or any other aquatic application, brushless motors that can run in water with no problem. Now if he gets an order to make these motors, he will. <clears throat> But he is not going to regularly run them, and Sumax themselves are not going to just carry them. So if Get FPV or somebody like that decides they want an order of 500,000, 2,000 of these innovations, my assumption is that he will run them. Um, but I got a hold of him, I got a hell of a, a deal on, you know, 16 of these motors, and hopefully that'll hold me over for a while. So those are the major parts of the powertrain. Those are gonna determine most of the flight characteristics of how this thing flies. And those are the parts I've settled on. Anything else, and then my Runcam Eagle Mini. Now, I did something that a lot of people aren't gonna like, and that's to give myself a little bit of extra room, I went ahead and, and popped it out of the front a little bit. And you know, if it turns out to be too hard on the camera, then I can flip these around and slide them back and that's fine. I mean, even the camera falls in that bracket, but to me, camera is a highly personalized part of the package. It has a lot to do with preference. So anything else that changes is going to be minor. If I change the receiver, I'm running an XM Plus in here, especially now that they have the RSSI running on it. Um, it should be sufficient because even though having all that telemetry stuff is handy, it's not something I ever really used much. I, I didn't use my alarms and all for it. Uh, I tried, but there are problems sometimes and I just didn't have the patience to, to deal with it. 
And then I'm running TBS Unify HVs, uh, the race editions. I've always run races. I, I don't really care to run over 200 milliwatts. I'm always flying with other people when I can and just as a rule of thumb, when you've got two, three, four people in the air, you're not blasting 800 milliwatts. You're trying to, you know, share the airwaves. So since I wouldn't use it anyway, I just run the races. I may move over to a tramp, you know, but again, that's kind of minor. With my good old boy CNHL batteries, uh, I do have a, a half a dozen Thunder Power Adrenalines that I use when I really want something with just a little more kick, a little more carry, um, that I'm going to be able to get maybe just a hair more flight time out of since they're lighter or be able to manage the, the balance a little better. And then the obligatory GoPro 5. I am getting rid of every other quad I own. And I'm gonna have two of these running. I may build a third at a later time, but I'm gonna keep two of these running and probably one flow ride as well. That the flow ride will kind of be my my junker. So if there's something that I'm doing that I don't feel comfortable doing it with my my main flyers then I'll do it with a flow ride. And in the event that something happens with the main two, I still have the flow ride, but I really prefer this floss style frame. So, it's time to get some props on this thing. And I guess get outside and do a maiden because I haven't flown this thing yet. 